Olá a todos, sejam bem-vindos, be welcome a este último dia né, do nosso congresso, sem dúvida ele tem sido um sucesso, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos pela participação. Hoje nós temos uma sessão muito interessante, principalmente para esses momentos né, no qual estamos vivendo, né? e é, nós teremos aí a moderação do nosso querido professor Fernando, né, que, o qual irá introduzir aos palestrantes, tá bem? já ficando aí é, a consideração de que o evento será gravado durante a apresentação dos nossos palestrantes, e uma vez seja inicializado o debate, nós apagaremos a, a gravação, e assim dessa forma dar maior liberdade de expressão a todos os participantes, tudo bem? Então, lhe concedo a palavra, Fernando, obrigado. Good, uh, good morning. Um, Bem-vindos uh, ao Congresso. My name is Fernando Bandeira and I will be uh, with you for these two and a half hours um, as moderator uh, of the, the Congress, uh, the second conference, international conference on human, uh, humanitarian action, cooperation and development. Wesley, which is one of, um, of our uh, organizers, asked me to, to tell you that the certificate with uh, 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 25 hours uh, will be released in the next 15, 15 days. If um, the, the, the certificate will be sent to the, to the email from where you, resist, you, you made your registration. Wesley is with us. Uh, in fact, is it, it, it is Wesley that introduced me. So, if you have any doubt, you can contact him uh, in a private message. Okay. So, um, allow me to to start to start um, my my introduction by reminding uh, a read of John Donne, which I think. It goes like a, a glove to our days and to, to the theme of our conference, which is Christ management. No man is an island, the entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of Maine. If a cold be washed away by the sea, Europe is less as well if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of the difference of thing on where any man said diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know from whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I think, uh, I, Looking at the images of nowadays, it's, I think it, goes, it fits like a globe. Going any, a little bit further, there was time in recent times that we don't know for sure who was in, in conflicts, who was the right and who was the wrong. Many times we have to choose for the, 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 the better worst. This is not this is not the time. Now in the conflicts of Ukraine, you we know for sure who is whom. But still we run the, the risk of being tired of the whole situation. Many people are starting to talk about it. But make no mistakes. If if you, you get tired of the situation, if you don't want to spend a few more bucks, the next time won't be the Ukrainians dying, will be us here in Europe. So be aware and be cooperative with Ukrainians. Just to finish, uh, this is some kind of strange time where you see every our uh, international relation teacher or expert speaking in, in TV, but they are only commenting the facts. I think 
that it should start to be um, human, uh, human uh, social uh, uh, scientists start to, to come to talk uh, in scientific terms. That's what we are going to try to do, addressing the, the theme of crisis management. Uh, my, uh, there will be four, four speakers. Um, Robert Nalbandov will talk about uh, Russia-Ukraine clash. Um, Lucas uh, Ubankniak Ubank will talk about the case of Nisi in Nepal. Um, Isabella Brink, who has the as proxy, Professor João Casqueira, will address the case of refugees in Denmark. And uh, at last, Shrova uh, Rukairam uh, will, will talk about communication and humanitarian crisis. If you, if you allow me, I would like to introduce uh, Robert uh, Nabdov, who will talk, as I, I said, um, on Russian Ukrainian clash, is PhD in uh, political science, is, is teaching at Angelo State University in the Department of Security Studies and Criminal Justice, is a postdoc in uh, international relations uh, by the University of St. Andrews, and actually, in, in, at the moment, is a researcher in the ISCTE University in Lisbon. So, Professor Robert Nadalf, please uh, take, take the words, and uh, is the time and space is all yours. Be welcome. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me here, and I, I totally appreciate your time and space allocated for this uh, short uh, presentation. As you very correctly said, uh, we unfortunately never know where this whole thing will end. And if it's now it's Ukraine, beware that some time before that, uh, back in 2008, it was Georgia. And people say, well, a little bit of appeasement of Putin may not do any harm, and possibly he will stop here and let us give him this uh, uh, red button of reset, and we will probably be happy with that alone. Unfortunately, um, how many, six years after that, in 2014, that we started again, and now we have 2022. So my major uh, questions here is that, that, that I would like to talk to you about is actually two, why now? Why is it Russia decided all of a sudden to start the war or what it's called the special operation in Ukraine now in February, 2022, and not say before that, not say a year before. And it's not that uh, the coronavirus pandemic had any influence over the military actions in the world. We, we know uh, that they never stopped. We know the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan started actually in the, in the midst of pandemic and um, how it was kind of carried on. We know that uh, there are other military operations here like a Turkey in, in Syria. So pandemic is not an excuse not to fight, unfortunately. <laughs> And then, and neither is uh, the Olympic Games, because if you if you think about 2008 in Georgia, it was in a sense uh, the, the defiant move by Putin, who decided to violate on the rules of, well, unwritten but well spoken and well agreed rules of um, Olympic Games that the wars end, and now too. So why now? And the second question would be, what is next? how this whole thing may end, okay? I think that we are talking about uh, the country that has been going through a severe identity challenges. And those identity challenges were um, kind of present there for all this time, ever since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, the questions of who are we 
and where we're going is actually even an oldest question because the whole time of the Russian Empire, they were trying to really understand, are we in the East, are we in the West, are we in between? Is it Eurasia or Asiopa? So which part of us should prevail? And after the collapse, and, and, and the collapse, of, sorry, and, and then the Soviet Union gave them so much needed identity of a superpower, of a hegemon, that was nurtured from within and from outside. From outside, everybody was so afraid of the two hegemons. So on, on the one hand, you had the US and the NATO, and on the other hand, you had um, other organizations. You had uh, uh, the Warsaw Treaty Pact, you had uh, the, the, the Chinese go, uh, building on their own influence in there. But uh, the idea, the identity of uh, a superpower was really embedded in the Russian psyche. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had all of a sudden this whole country that doesn't know what it is, where it is going, and wants to find its place in the world. For the uh, first 10 years, up until uh, 2000, Russia did not know where it was going, because what they saying after the ascent of Putin to power was that we had a weak leader. It, all of it comes to the very strong leader, the uh, notion of Putin to be on the helm. Another part of uh, the problem is uh, the constant, um, I would say, existential fear of annihilation. So if you look through the history of Russia, this country has always been either under attack by the neighbors, by the enemies, or it was itself threatening their neighbors and their enemies. Now they're saying that we were all peaceful and we never attacked, but Russia waged 12 wars against Turkey, against the Sultanate, just to get foothold uh, of that, um, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. With the Caspian Sea, they fought about, I think it was a four or five wars with Iran, with the Persian Empire, just to get there. So the idea that nobody is really threatening them, which happened within those 10 periods of 10 years um, between 90, 1990 and uh, 2000, was really alien to the Russian political culture. So, and then it refers to the feeling of threatened, the feeling of animosity, the feeling of everybody is against us. And in these terms, they hate us because they ain't us, that they're all the world is jealous of Russia, of its uh, deep, uh, deeply uh, 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 spiritual soul, and so on and so forth. Now you can see that Russia is really doing exactly what I said. They re they're retreating from everything. Now they're saying that the West has no uh, intellectual capability of raise a good specialist in any aspect. And that is exactly why we left the Bologna system um, we left, they, they left uh, um, other processes, they left um, practically all international cooperation, they're shutting down the universities that have even a small modicum of the Western influence. So the fear of being living in a constant annihilation pushes Russia to the point where it decides to, to, to launch a preemptive strike against Ukraine. Obviously, that goes back in, in, in the idea of having this de Gaulian uh, grandeur. Now, the, the, the country really, if you think about it, it in economic terms, it's number uh, 11 in terms of their real nominal GDP. Uh, but with the GDP per capita, it is uh, number 57 between Croatia and uh, Chile. And I would like to uh, show you this little screen here, which would present um, an idea of this, this, this really appalling disparity in, in, in that sense. Just look at that. So Russia is, even without Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, uh, ca Caucasian countries, uh, Central Asian countries, is the biggest country in the world. Yet its population is smaller than the population of Bangladesh. So you may ask the question, why? Does Russia need so much land? Why is it feel? Why does it feel threatened by others? Why does it want to expand? Well, I think that uh, it goes to the idea of resources. 
And it goes back to the idea of uh, the Russian identity. Another very important factor in understanding why Russia launched it right now, right in February, is geography. So being pretty much outside of uh, uh, the warm uh, weather cap, I will share the screen again with you. So if you look here, these are the URLs here. Mostly life is centered along the Western parts of Russia. You know, you have St. Petersburg, you have Moscow, uh, you have a little bit of the South here, but everything beyond that is the frozen land. It's taiga, it's tundra. So yeah, it has a lot of resources. It has timber, Russia has a lot of gas, Russia has a lot of oil, but what it does not have is the possibility of trading. So two seas, pretty much. This is Caspian Sea. This is the Black Sea. As of sea, it's, it's nothing. It's just drying out. So if I share you another screen here, hold on. Let me see, how do I, uh, maybe this one? Yeah. So I counted 65 ports, you know? 65. These are all maritime ports of Russia. Now, the fun part starts here when you think about, okay, so 65, but how many of them are operational around a year, 12 months out of the year? You will find there are only five. These are centered all in this little teeny tiny space in the Black Sea region. Sevastopol and Taman and the Yevpatoria, Yalta, Fyodosia, Kerch, that used to belong to Ukraine before uh, 2014 when, when they just chopped it off. So on the one hand, this gigantic begemoth has no way to trade properly with the world, except for those little part which constitutes infinitesimally small part of its borders. Everything here is frozen. These can mostly operate three, four months out of the year. And then nothing, nada. Zilch. So on the one hand, Russia wanted to get rid of, uh, to, 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 to expand its territory in, in order to be able to move its enormous resources, including timber, including wood, including all parts of their minerals and stuff to Europe to sell. But on the other hand, there's another major factor of NATO. And that rhymes back to the question of why now? Uh, Ukraine and Georgia were the two countries that expressed the idea of joining NATO. You may think about like, well, then why hasn't Russia done anything towards say, I don't know, uh, Armenia or um, Moldova. These are the countries that are actually former Soviet Union republics and um, they are in the same economic and political situation with the, with Russia and sorry with, with Ukraine and, and and the Georgia, but the problem is, but the question is that these countries they have not expressed at least openly and at least so much pushing with the idea of joining NATO versus Russia sorry versus Ukraine and Georgia did this on a numerous occasions on multiple occasions. They received um, the MAP status membership action plan. They received the status of the most preferred country. They received the status. It's, it's one more little teeny tiny step, teeny tiny step, but it's actually the fault of the international community itself because they did this just to appease both, appease Putin and appease uh, political forces in Ukraine and in Georgia to keep them within the uh, general kind of uh, Euro Atlantic institutional framework without granting them this much potential of becoming the, main, uh, the NATO members. So if you think about the, um, uh, let me see if I can have this thing. Yeah, I'll show you another, the same screen here. So Ukraine in the Black Sea covers pretty much, this is Ukraine. So imagine what happens if Ukraine becomes NATO ever. So, Putin is terrified, that goes back to my, my additional concept of fear, that NATO will simply cut off Russian trade here. 
because Russia is a almost 100% um, kind of uh, single, not a single commodity, but a single uh, trade function oriented country. It sells its uh, resources, enormous, gigantic resources, and it wants to continue selling it. Has Ukraine become a member of NATO? Obviously, in, in, in the mind of Putin, NATO is its arch enemy. Then NATO would simply cut this thing out, will not allow Russia to uh, move freely, or Russia will be held hostages to it. The idea of being a member of any alliance is really appalling to the Russian political mentality, Russian political culture. They want to be above the alliances. And in their view, the alliance means that your hands are tight by institutional uh, norms, rules, and regulations of the alliance you're in. Putin, he famously made this statement uh, back in uh, 2013, I think. He said that uh, Russia, thank God, is not a member of any alliance. That means that we can do whatever we want. Well, yes, I mean, Russia is a member of um, this collective defense treaty, but it's just a nominal organization. Uh, Russia is a member of BRICS, but it's again, it's uh, with, with Brazil, uh, India, China, um, South Africa. But, but it's again, it's a trade, it's nothing else. What Putin meant here is a military alliance that nobody can tell us what to do. And we want to be the masters of our own fate. Now, the second question, is remaining why uh, sorry what would happen now what are the the, the scenarios especially keeping in mind that russia has already been um, you know brandishing their nuclear club that they would attack that they, 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 they would keep the right to use uh, nuclear weapons uh, if only their territorial integrity is attacked or something like that so the question is what now what will happen so there are several scenarios. One scenario is that Putin loses the war um, and um, employs at least tactical nuclear weapons in um, deploys them, sorry, not employs, deploys them in, in Ukraine and turns the whole land to, uh, um, to basically no man's land. That is, uh, uh, that is one scenario. Because if I lose, then, and he made this statement many times. He said, uh, there shouldn't be any world without Russia. What's the point of having this globe if there's no Russia? And in their mentality, Ukrainians are Russians. They're poisoned by vicious West. Their mind is kind of corrupted by the Nazi uh, America. Because in the Russian political mentality, it is the America that set up um, uh, the, the, the Germany Nazis against the Soviet Union. They don't consider the fact that they signed the molotov ribbentrop Pact. So in their mentality, it's America is the arch enemy. So the U.S. had corrupted the, the minds, the brains of Ukrainians, taught them they're different from Russians, converted them into Nazis, and Nazi is the biggest, um, a biggest boogeyman of the contemporary Russian political culture. And if you think that I am um, overemphasizing what it is, I just show you uh, uh, a picture that a friend of mine posted, <laughs> posted on the Facebook. Um, let me see. Here it goes. Let me see if I can share the screen. Yeah. So this is a, um, the historical reconstructionism. You know, like, um, I mean, in the States, I haven't seen them here now, but in the States, we have a lot of uh, uh, groups that dress like um, medieval knights and <laughs> they have their records to like different battles and they have armors and shields and whatnot. So the same thing in Russia. And this is called uh, the, uh, the Festival of uh, Historical Reconstruction. The Times and Epochs will take place in Moscow from 9 to 13 of June, which is like today, <laughs> uh, in 61 different parts of the city. And the motto of this event is 20 
centuries of Russia's victories. So it literally started uh, when uh, Jesus Christ was 22 years old. So since then, Russia has been kind of victorious, 20 uh, centuries. So the idea that Russia could lose is almost non-existent in the mentality. So if we lose, it's not with us, it's with the world. So screw the world if we lose they would uh, openly threaten the world with, the, they, they are threatening with the nuclear wars. Now, the second scenario is that Russia gets um, some concessions, some appeasements in terms of a territory, in terms of uh, the Eastern Ukrainian uh, settlements, and obviously gets to hold its Crimea. Um, and in this case, probably Ukraine needs also to be appeased. Probably Ukraine will not be just fast forwarded into uh, the, 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 the European Union membership, but also NATO membership. Because Ukraine needs some sort of guarantees, as well as the, the, um, the whole world, as the, uh, um, as the facilitator of this meeting mentioned uh, just a minute before I started, that we need the guarantees that whatever happens in Ukraine will not be carried over to the world. For Russia, it's very simple. It is I, meaning Russia, as the biggest hegemon, need to have another hegemon. Because if another hegemon is not threatening me, that I lose my, my hegemony status. If So in this case, it's kind of a mirror image. It's not that I'm a hegemon. It's not that I'm a superpower. Because if I'm a superpower, I need a superman, superhero. Superheroes need supervillains. If supervillains, so if superheroes have no supervillains, it's something like this Mega Mind cartoon. If you if you watch, right? If there's no supervillain, then there's no superhero. So Russia needs a supervillain. And in terms of uh, you, you, uh, like who the supervillain is, obviously it is NATO. Now, once Ukraine is there, and Ukraine is in the EU, everything will be settled down in in their views because there will be no way. For Russia to uh, expand, literally there would be NATO troops, and that would be, become the biggest buffer for Russia. The third scenario is this one, but without the NATO factor. That Ukraine is, uh, as Putin has been uh, for, uh, forcing this idea, that Ukraine is placed under no neutral zone, no uh, alliance membership no nuclear membership, nothing. But that was already what happened, actually. Back in 1994, Budapest Memorandum, so they, they signed exactly the same treaty. That these countries, which was uh, the, the, the nuclear countries where the, sorry, the, the former republics with the nuclear potential, they, they, they gave everything to, to Russia or destroy them, including Ukraine, and in exchange for the protection of territorial sovereignty. Funny. In fact, when uh, their um, foreign minister, Lavrov, asked, was asked, I mean, why did you violate the terms of this agreement? He came up with a brilliant excuse. He said, well, you know what? We signed this treaty with then leadership of Ukraine, not this leadership of Ukraine, which goes back to my initial question, why now? And also how to predict my last, my last point would be that uh, Russia is really reactionary power, it is a reactionary state, and Russia acts uh, in, a, in, in, in a sense, it's a mirror image of what the West does. Again, super uh, superhero needs to have a supervillain, and superhero waits. I mean, what is the job of a superhero? If, if, if you look through everything, superheroes do not just fly around. One minute, around. please. One minute, please. Superheroes do not fly around and uh, they do not do their superhero stuff. They wait for the supervillain to act. So one of the possibility, uh, one of the reason is that they were uh, existentially, existentially afraid that that could happen. And from that perspective, from that perspective, the fear of Ukraine being in NATO is something that is, 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 is pushing them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um...
there is one thing there is one interesting thing um, ah, it's okay there is one interesting thing um, about the ukrainian crisis i have an old student of mine is working in bangkok at or no my own son is in in macau and i ask them and i ask them um all, all, all things are conceived uh, in, in the Asian countries so far, and uh, somehow the, the Asians look at the Ukrainian uh, conflict as we, we look uh, uh, of the conflicts like in Myanmar and things like that. It's something that happens so far away, why bother with, with it? Uh, that's no big deal for us. And it puts it puts here uh, in context in context the question of distance and how how do you we care with the others and I I go back to to my 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 beginning text no man is an, an island and we are seeing that um, the the consequences of the alimentary crisis and uh, all around the world uh, the consequences of the crisis so that's why uh, i'm going to uh, it is in this context context i'm going to pass the the, the word to lucas uberbank with which is studying uh, humanitarian and uh, action in cooperation for development and is working uh, in nepal with an organization named night design and you work in 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 questions of uh, humanitarian uh, 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 development, uh, namely in questions of menstrual hygiene management, uh, is is now in the, the the situation of cooperation and emergency. Um, in this context, context he is he, he involved in a project of the conception of products with uh, with high potential so with high social and um, environmental uh, the potential so lucas please let us know what you are doing and what what is uh, your message around that question of humanitarian crisis go ahead if you please we have 10 minutes Thank you very much, Professor, for introducing me. Um, so, since we don't have much time, I'll actually go straight to the point. And I prepared a presentation, if you allow me to make this speech a little bit more um, uh, visibly leadable. Um, okay. Mm. Do you see my screen? That's a question. Yes, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, it's, it's working. Yes, okay. Okay, so now you should see the portion of my screen. Okay, so as I said, I'm going straight to the point because we don't have much time. I will use that situation, uh, I will use that platform here to say something about menstrual taboo around the world and the implications of this taboo in the low and middle income countries as that became lately one of my personal missions uh, and we are on the development congress uh, so i will say something about the implications on the female life in low and middle income countries uh, but also in the end i will, I will um, say a few sentences and, and describe the project that Nidizi is, is implementing at the moment in nepal to counteract um, the situation which is there so a quick overview, I'll just go through menstrual taboos and later on I'll say a few things about menstrual health management, what it actually is, uh, the implications of taboo, uh, menstrual restrictions uh, which are still existing in Nepal and, and, and are quite common, and then later on about the Sparsa Pot project. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to say something about the taboo. So taboo is a subject for the action that is avoided for religious or social reasons. So it's originated from the Polynesian word tapu, and I thought that is a really good way of starting our discussion today, because tapu in Polynesian means something which is too powerful to talk about or to act on. 
and this is the clue of um of, of of menstrual taboo around the world which is quite universal doesn't matter if we'll take um the studies from nepal india or even great britain for example in the uk there was uh, uh there was a uh, um, big research done about the perception of menstruation among the pre menarchers so girls before their first period, which already linked menstruation to, um, to the feeling of disgustment, to something not to speak about. So I really want to everyone to remember from this, this lecture, let's say that this is a very, very universal thing. So um, menstruation was for a long time uh, put in the level of uh, magic, unfortunately, negatively, as it was assigned to impurity, uh, danger, and pollution. And we can find it in many religions all around the world and belief systems. Um, Hinduism, which we are going to talk about today, uh, is probably the most harshest on, on, on menstruation, menstruators. However, we can find it also in, in Islam, in Judaism, even in Christianity as well, in, in the Orthodox Church there are still some restrictions on menstruations. Uh, so exists more than 5,000 anthemism for the term menstruation. And, and as I pointed, uh, as it was actually pointed by Alma Gottlieb, that's one of the uh, main precursors of writing about the menstruation in society, wars tell a story, so do efforts to avoid them. So basically this menstrual taboo for a long time is preserving the status quo, uh, which is very hazardous for women, especially in a low and middle income setting. So due to this topic tabuization, the needs of menstruating women were long neglected. Um, and there was basically no political or social will of transforming the environment to a little bit more inclusive for women. And we are talking about something which is happening every month for a few days to every woman in their uh, after puberty and before menopause. Okay, um, so what is menstrual health management? Maybe let's start like this. So menstrual health management wasn't really defined for a long, long time. Um, perhaps the most relevant attempts to define menstrual health management um, was developed by the Terminology Action Group of the Global Menstruation Collective. And that's only 2018, uh, 19, sorry, 2019. So researchers for a long time struggled actually to define what it is. I didn't bring the entire definition here as it is quite detailed and long. However, the most important pillars of menstrual health management is the knowledge. So providing every woman and girl with a fair education about reproductive health and also teaching about menstruation as a natural body process to contradict all of the misconceptions, myths and superstitions. Another pillar is facilities. And when I'm saying that it needs to include privacy. So for example, locks at doors, access to water and soap, to clean genitalia, but also uh, absorbing materials, um, and also disposal system. This is very important. So since menstruation very stigmatized in many countries, especially in low and middle income setting, um, menstruators struggle a lot to change their um, menstrual, uh, menstrual blood absorbance without being noticed to be menstruating at the moment, which is a very stigmatized state. And the third one is efficient and hygienic products. So that's a three pillars of menstrual health management, which is generally um, put in the uh, development sector of, of wash, water, uh, sanitation, and health. So the lack of knowledge is it's, it's the main input from uh, influence, which, which takes its place from, um, from the tabuization of the topic. So teachers tend to skip the subject linked to reproductive health and, and order kids to do it at home and entire responsibility of actually teaching uh, menstrual management lays on mothers. And here we comes to the cycle as these mothers never received the proper education themselves neither. So the, um, the hazardous habits are, are uh, re um, uh, reproduced from generation to another. They're passed from generation to another. So a little bit of data, I kind of like data. So uh, lack of knowledge, there was, for example, a research uh, taken in Ghana, which claimed that uh, almost 70% of, uh, of girls before menarche, so before the first period, they didn't know anything about uh, menstruation. 
or there are researches, for example, one from India uh, in rural places of Rajasthan, where as much as 98% of this didn't know anything about it. We have to remember that also there is a lot of restrictions and, and this notion of impurity. So we are talking about something very traumatic here. Um, there's lack of knowledge on what menstruation actually is and how to handle it as well, which has a lot of implications on health, for example. So lack of knowledge, of course, results in eye hygienic uh, menstrual practices. So women in low and middle income countries generally use old cloths or rags, which itself is actually not a very big problem if the proper knowledge is uh, given to them. Uh, this is old cloths, for example, or, or, or pieces of blankets. It's a pretty decent way of, of absorbing menstrual blood as long as these are taught how often to change it, how to clean it, how to dry it well. However, in some extreme situations, uh, women use dried leaves, cow dung, mud, and uh, straw or ashes, for example, which is a very hazardous to their health. That can cause irritations, urinary, tr urinary tract infections, reproductive tract infections, and some other uh, health problems which are more um, assigned to pregnancy or even can cause infertility. Uh, also, there is a psychological effect of, of constant feeling of shame and constant need of hiding their stigmatized state as like every month a girl um, spends ridiculous amount of energy and thoughts on actually hiding. And again, very often women don't have effective absorbance. So, so hiding their menstrual state is not that easy. Okay, so that have impact on anxiety, depression, and stress. Now, perhaps the most researched sphere of female life is schooling, as researchers see that significant increase of girls uh, are dropping out once they reach their puberty, and menstruation was addressed as one of the main reasons. I'm saying one of the main reasons because it's very hard to prove that it is actually menstruation as uh, in, in the countries of Global South, one a girl which puberty, there is a lot of changes and expectations towards her. So it's quite hard to actually prove that this is menstruation causing it, but it was proved by many researchers. Uh, so school absenteeism, very often girls lose from two to five days of school per month. This is mainly due to lack of absorbent again and lack of facilities as well. We also know that there is a very big problem with half a day absenteeism, as for example, because of the lack of, uh, of facilities, uh, which would be menstrual supportive, they need to leave the school for two, three hours, walk to school to change their material and come back. And there is also the psychological problem of the fear and shame as the teasing is, is, is very, very common. And uh, another data, so another research in Ghana, so 120 girls in one of the rural schools were given uh, 12 pads per month, uh, and the school absenteeism was cut by half. And in the end, uh, almost seven days, uh, so each girl on average, and this is important on average, almost seven uh, days more they were spending during one semester in school. So this is a huge number, especially when we look at the vulnerable groups, when, when, when it's like 15 or even 20 days a semester. Uh, so just by providing effective uh, material, we can really keep these girls at school. Of course, the problems, uh, the, the menstrual related problems don't stop while uh, once the girl is leaving school. So the same problems um, are uh, quite present in the workplace. So here, unfortunately, we don't have much research on that. However, there was a very famous uh, research in, in, in Bangladesh. So in one of the cloth factories, uh, researchers were asking uh, women about their menstrual practices and, 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 and their environment at work um, and how menstruation is influencing that. So it was found out that 73% of, of, of uh, factory workers were missing up to six days uh, per month because of menstruation and they were they were paid by the efficiency so it was harming a lot the women's finance and the, the the family finance but also it was harming the company itself right because because these women were not coming to work so again 
once we give uh, the paths, this absent, ab absentism, which was 73% of women who were absent from work, dropped down to 3%. There was a lot of different things as well, as, as for example, women were obligated to um, were obligated to take contra contraceptives, contra contra contraceptive pills, for example, because they felt obligated not to go to the toilet all the time because there's no breaks and so on, and the, the toilets and facilities are not supported. There is a lot of uh, things about it. The last things, uh, last sphere which I wanted to um, highlight here is the social exclusion. As women and girls in low and middle income countries often report that their movement and participation uh, outside their household during, during menses is limited or withheld. Again, the same story, no absorbance, no facilities. For me, for example, in Nepal, maybe it wasn't that visible from the first sign, but traveling in Nepal long distances is extremely hard for menstruators as, as there is no, um, no privacy at all, no means, no nothing. That means that these women for five days, for example, are, are, are just kept at home because they, they are scared of, 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 of living, uh, making them basically the second category uh, citizen. Okay, so coming to Nepal, I wanted to say a few words about the restrictions that are imposed on menstruators in Nepal. As Nepal is predominantly Hindu um, oriented, uh, around 82% of, of, of uh, Hindu population, of Nepali population is following Hinduism. So there is almost 90% uh, of women and girls throughout the country reported experiencing some form of restriction or exclusion. So the, definitely the most common is that uh, they cannot visit the places for worship or they cannot really worship at home as in, in Hindu houses, there is a little temple. They cannot do that during the menses. But also there is a ban of entering the kitchen. There is a ban of touching males. There is a ban of touching plants as it is uh, believed that women who, which touch the plant, I mean, the plant will rot straight away. There is a ban of touching animals. Um, there is also this thing of sleeping separately. So very often they need to sleep in a corner or, or outside the house or in most extreme, that's generally far Western region of Nepal, there is Chaupadi culture. So there is, a, uh, there is this culture of, of, of sending girls and women who menstruate to specially designated sheds. Um, and for me, it was quite hard in the beginning to understand what we are talking about. So I also took some pictures to, to show what the shed actually means. So the shed is generally quite far away in, in, in the middle of the field or in the middle of the forest. So by sending uh, girls and women there, uh, we, the, the women are vulnerable uh, to poisonous snake bites hypothermia, uh, dehydration, for example, or, or they have a lot of lung problems as during the winter time, they need to um, have fires in this shed to, to warm up, for example. So there is a lot of, a lot of uh, hazards uh, which are assigned to this culture, for example. So, and also I would say that this is more striking in my opinion, for example, the average age of menarch in Nepal is before 13, that the, the average age of menarch differs from country to country. In Nepal, it's a little bit before 13 years old. So we send, the, like, send, sending their girls, which are like 13, 14, 15 years old, is extremely dangerous because we are talking about the country where the rape culture is uh, still robust. Um, so I think that I don't really have to explain what we're talking about here. And anyways, this culture is extremely, extremely um, dangerous for girls. So maybe what we are trying to do to fight it now, to not be that negative about things. So uh, we're trying to implement a, a project which has the holistic approach. I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about the holistic approach in a second. However, we are trying to open a, a social enterprise, which is going to produce uh, biodegradable biodegradable banana fiber pads uh, to the markets. So basically uh, how it works at, at this moment, there is a, a lot of banana plantations in Nepal, which uh, and banana tree needs to be cut every year or two. So the pseudo stream basically becomes an agricultural waste. There is no, uh, nothing to do with it. 
it just just lays on on the on the side of a river or or whatever. So we want to take that agricultural waste, shred it. I don't want to go to the technicals too much. Uh, however, on the first picture here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. But on the first picture here, you can see like the life of the fiber, how it becomes uh, the menstrual pad in the end. So we have the technology. The technology is known. We know it, how to do it. Um, and this is what we want to do while also um, giving work to the women from uh, rural places in Nepal, which are economically excluded. So basically, um, this is the more or less the concept of sparsa. So we are taking banana fibers from the from 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 the farmers. In return, we are giving them um, um, our our um, waste, which can uh, which can be used in their fields actually to fertilize the field the fields. Uh, we are going to uh, give jobs to women to work in banana fiber factory and also in menstrual pad factory. Later on, we are going to introduce these um, pads to the market. And also we are planning to sell it to the government as there is uh, uh, in, in, in the past years, there is this movement of, of actually dis distributing pads in, in the schools. So we want to sell these pads to the government as well. And later on, the revenue which we are going to obtain from these sales of pads, we can um, we can first of all, of course, spend on salaries of employees. That 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 needs to be, and all of the rest of the profit, let's say, uh, will come for uh, will will be spent on menstrual health management workshop campaigns, distribution of pads to women that cannot afford them. Uh, we want to invest in MHM uh, suitable facilities in rural schools, reasonable pad trainings, uh, because many women still won't be able to pad and uh, to buy any of these pads, and 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 just uh, invest in in other actors which are also active in awareness and advocacy. So we are doing that already for a few years. So we have quite big experience in that. However, as I said, there is not political societal will. Um, to change this uh, situation, meaning that it's very, very hard for us to, for example, obtain funds. As part of my master thesis, I went to through uh, sustainable development goals, for example, and all of the targets which it has. So sub-target is around 170 and indicators 150, I think, around. The word menstruation doesn't come there even once. That means that for us as organization which is working in this field, it is extremely hard to obtain funds for such matters, because this is not directly stressed and addressed. So, um, so yeah, just to sum, it, sum up the main goals of the project, we want to financially uh, empower women living, uh, living in, in the rural areas. So we want to give them jobs. This is something as the approach of, of, of the community empowerment, uh, basically. It's not giving them, but rather including them to the process. Um, then uh, we want to rise accessibility of menstrual pads uh, in the country. Uh, we want to strengthen the Nepali local economy. This is extremely important, especially that Nepal is a very dependent economy. The income uh, import to export ratio of, of, of Nepal is around 12 and a half to one. So for every exported one dollar, Nepal needs to import Twelve and a half dollars. This is a very dependent economy, so we need to invest as much as as possible into the domestic production, uh, in on, order to to boost the the economy there. Uh, so, financement of of uh, awareness and advocacy uh, in the field of menstrual health management. Also, uh, enforcement of cooperation between actors that can work there, uh, and minimizing plastic pollution. Like the, the average woman in her life, if using uh, commercial uh, absorbents, uh, throws away around 120 to 150 kg of pads, um, tampons, and so on. So in the countries of the global south, there is an increase of the use, which we want. That's what we are aiming for. Uh, increase of use of um, conventional menstrual uh, products. However, this is also a huge risk to the environment, right? Because 
uh, we can only imagine if everyone, uh, if, if, if all of the women at one day will start using them, uh, what we'll do with that. As in countries like Nepal, for example, the waste management system is not functioning at all. So it all uh, goes to the rivers, to the water banks and, and is buried or burned and so on and so on. While um, conventional products are 90% made out of plastic. So um, I hope that this few goals here show the holistic approach that we are going to try. And in the end of that, I will also say that the idea, the concept of it is that the social enterprise will be absolutely independent from Nidizi uh, from, from the beginning. In the beginning, we're going to help, of course, to, to, to run it. However, it will be independent, um, independent company uh, because we believe in uh, human uh, in, in in community empowerment, and we believe that that's the way how development should uh, be in twenty first century. Okay, oof, I made it in time. I think. <laughs> Brad, in chat, in chat, um, Lucas, thank you very much for the, your enlightening presentation. Uh, now uh, I'm going. Uh, we are going to speak about the case of refugees in Denmark. Um, I, I, João Casqueira, which is uh, also an organizer of the meeting, of the, the conference, uh, will be the proxy as uh, due to per personal uh, question uh, issues. Isabella cannot be uh, with us. Um, before it passed, the the word the 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 to to João Casqueira uh, there is one thing that uh, in Europe uh, I think it is important to think of um, there is there there are some there are crises that are more crises than others when we talk when we talk about Ukrainians uh, the, the uh, the way the Europe deals with the problem is too much different from the, the refugees in the Mediterranean. Um, the question is, is there a big difference in the, the value of human life if, if the life is from a Ukrainian or from a refugee in the Mediterranean? Um, there, there is a lot of issues to think um, in that question. But uh, uh, for now, I will pass to, to just do a, a little introduction of, about, of Isabella, which is a, a, a student in the Master of Humanitarian Action, Cooperation and Develop, Development. He, he has uh, working, he's been working um, in the ground uh, for his final project with the issue of asylum seekers and refugees in Denmark which is the, the team she, she, she is going to address. And it has been linked with several research projects special in the area of social rights. Professor João, if you please uh, take the comments and presentation. We are not here, do you? Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Um, sorry for, for starting a bit late. Um, so hello to everybody. Sorry, um, Isabella could not be with us for, for family reasons, for serious family reasons. So I'm um, replacing her. Um, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, the topic is the case of refugees in Denmark, and um, I'm just summarizing uh, three aspects of her research, uh, which I have been supervising, and uh, with her authorization, I'm uh, then concentrating on um, the context of her study, 
uh, the problem of her study, and lastly, the focus on of the study. So, um, first of all, the context. Um, Denmark has been a rather friendly country when speaking in terms of uh, foreigners' integration, asylum seekers' rights, and compliance of refugee law in the past. Uh, I must insist, and this is one of the key questions, uh, this happened in the past. We have a certain image of Denmark, especially in Europe, but also in the world, I believe. Uh, but uh, of course, this is changing a little bit and we may ask ourselves, and Isabella is doing so, why uh, this is happening. But let's look back in the past. As an example, Denmark was the first country to ratify the United Nations 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. And also among the first countries to implement the convention and its uh, 1967 protocol. In addition, uh, we can also uh, pinpoint that uh, when other countries um, implement more stringent policies in the 80s, especially in Europe, it Denmark introduced in 1983 the Alliance Act, which was considered as Europe's most liberal asylum legislation. And since 1979, Denmark has worked with the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, in resettling refugees in the country. And we are talking about um, a de facto uh, situation of um, uh, integration. And it took uh, affirmative positions, even some debatable ones, such as the widest rights of asylum seekers to reunite with their families. Uh, the example of the position of Denmark during the civil war during the, the war in former Yugoslavia, uh, was also paradigmatic. Let's remind that at that time, approximately uh, 9,000 spontaneous asylum seekers arrived in the country during 1992, and uh, a law was passed almost on the spot, the so-called Yugoslav law. Um, residency uh, permits for persons from former Yugoslavia. But since uh, mid of the last decade, more or less, and increasingly since uh, 1980 and, 19, uh, and, and also uh, the end of the last decade, the Danish immigration policy changed its focus from pro-integration focus to a pro-security focus leading to deportation and what Isabel called a pro-deportation policy. Using the concept of human security, so the this, this focus um, of territorial security that has been developed by the Danish government has had an impact on human security as it increased the uncertainty and the human insecurity. So basically, Isabella works on studying this human insecurity in Denmark as a result of the change of, of focus. So today, asylum seekers navigate with uncertainty while negotiating their positions, not only in the Danish society itself, but also within their own families and within the life. Move to the second point, the problem. What's the problem? There is a legal problem 
And beginning of last decade, the Refugee Board's Coordination Committee of Denmark decides on the basis of an inquiry to suspend all deportations to Syria as a result of the civil war that escalated in the country since March of that year. This position was also supported by European law. It's actually um, a key case law from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, that's the case Sufi and, El and Elmi versus United Kingdom. Um, this um, is an important case because it makes um, the deportation uh, by government uh, to areas of generalized violence such as war, um, a breach or potential breach of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which prohibits uh, torture and uh, inhuman and degrading treatments. So deporting someone to an area where there's generalized violence may um, be equal to uh, uh, practicing torture. As from September uh, 2013, the Refugee Board Coordination Committee reached the conclusion that the situation in Syria has worsened so significantly that asylum seekers from certain areas of the country, including areas surrounded by the capital Damascus, on return would be at real risk for their life security. On this ground, board practice was changed so that Syrians from particularly war-torn parts of the country received a residence permit after the Danish Lion Act, paragraph 772, on the basis of the general situation in the country and without individual need for protection. So in a way, escaping to the classical definition of refugee, according to UNHCR. The problem came from a provision of this Danish Alliance Act, paragraph 7.3, on temporary protection status, which was inserted in, in, in 2015. It was stated that the pur purpose of the provision was to ensure that refugees whose protection needs are more temporary can be sent back as soon as the situation in the home country allows it. So they can be sent back um, upon analysis. And of course, this depends on an interpretation. So in February um, uh, of uh, the last decade, so in 2019, the Refugee Board announced that um, it was uh, that the coordination committee perception uh, position was that the general condition in certain parts of Syria had significantly improved and is opened the door to new practice of the Danish Immigration Service. Danish Immigration Service actually um, operate on the grand basis. And then the coordination board is a sort of appeal uh, board for their decisions. So, Let's move to the last point. What's the focus of the study of Isabella? We understood what's the context, what's the problem. Actually, it's a legal problem, an interpretation problem. The focus is on uh, actually temporary aspect practices. And the constant risk of being deported that is felt by, by the asylum seekers in Denmark. Uh, if we look at the migrant in integration policy, the, the MIPEX, that many of you uh, know, this index uh, makes a ranking of the countries as um, the, if they are more or less friendly in uh, relation to the integration of, of uh, migrants and, um, and asylum seekers, uh, refugees, um, we can see that um, two years ago, two, three years ago, this was the ranking, this is still the ranking. And as you can see, there is a problem in this ranking because it states temporary. What this means is that for the MIPEX, Denmark is not doing, uh, let's say the best job because 
the integration of migrants and asylum seekers refugees is just um, a temporary, it's not um, a more stable situation. So it should be improved. And we can see that some indicators are really um, not in the worst position, but have been better, uh, such as uh, family re reunion. So, and there is uh, also a new law that has been adopted in uh, 2018 and entering into 2019. It's a, um, a, an act, um, uh, 140, an act amending the Alliance Act, the Integration Act, the Repatriation Act, and various other acts. And this, uh, this legislation removed any mention that existed previously to the fact that the law has at its final purpose to derive our So this has a, a consequence João, João, in fact please, in the, please, the last conflict. last sentences yeah. we, uh, we cannot hear uh, clearly could yes. you repeat it so, yes we we this uh, this um, um, new legal situation has um, degraded the 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 situation the global situation of uh, asylum seekers in Denmark and it raises uh, many questions, especially considering the convention, which prohibits the expulsion or return, the so-called formal. Um, and this uh, can only uh, be done, or the deportation can only be done if there uh, are specific conditions uh, where uh, the asylum seeker uh, is uh, in fact in fault and has committed um, crimes or is uh, a danger for for the country. So it must be exceptional. Also, uh, we must uh, underline that uh, the non refoulement uh, that is the non-deportation, is a universal knowledge uh, human right. Uh, it is uh, mentioned in Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture, also, um, in the, the, the general comment on this, um, this uh, convention, it's also mentioned in other um, uh, legal region, regional, uh, as the American Convention on Humans. Uh, and also, let's remind that completing the Article um, 33 of the Convention relating to the status of refugees. Uh, the next article 34 is on naturalization. So uh, countries should encourage the simulation and the, the naturalization of refugees. Um, so this, this should be done. And in Denmark, if we come back to the MIPEX, we can observe that the situation is degrading. Uh, it's degrading um, because in the beginning of the, the last decade, for example, the situation as regards permanent residence was relatively high, and, and a few years after, it really worsened. Uh, of course, the other indicators can be stable or, or good, uh, such as family reunion can be stable. It's low, though. Um, so the lines that um, the research lines that um, uh, Isabella is um, following in her study are three. At first, it looks at the psychological effects, mainly stress, of this uh, legal standards degradation in Denmark. Second, it looks at um, also the impact on goals, options, and motivations of the persons. And lastly, and most importantly, I would say, a, chi a child rights, children development. And I would conclude with this. Because it's relatively shocking when, um, actually in class, I refer to this case, uh, students know about that. Um, a few years ago, even before this legislation was passed, Denmark was uh, considered in fault 
in relation to the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in the case IAM uh, versus Denmark. And this case involves uh, an, a, um, a, a young girl who was living with her family in Denmark, and uh, the family was about to be deported and, and considered that this deportation put at risk the health of the, the child because she may fear, uh, she may leave a, 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 a female um, um, mutilation, genital mutilation in Somalia. So, um, in, 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 interestingly, uh, this is a point to take into account. And Denmark, in this, um, in this case, argued that the, the area where the family was living in Somalia was not that much affected by this phenomenon of uh, female genital mutilation. Uh, we all, I think, uh, understand how hypocritical this kind of argument is. So thank you for listening and thank you for your interest in this case. If you have any question, uh, I would try to answer, uh, but of course, uh, it's not like Isabella. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor João Cascaira and uh, to, to Isabella in his absence um, with this enlightening uh, issue of refugees and refugee status and uh, elect questions. Um, I'm going to introduce the last speaker of our session, which is uh, Professor um, Alvaro Cairrão, which are going to talk uh, with us, um, to talk to us about communication and humanitarian crisis. Uh, Professor um, Alvaro Cairrão is a PhD and Master in Communication Science by the University Autónoma de Barcelona. He's also a researcher in the Centro de Estudos, Comunicação e Sociedade da Universidade do Minho, which is a center of communication and society studies. Um, uh, now he's doing a PhD in the same university as um, professionally, is now a uh, uh, professor in, in the uh, uh, Polytechnical Institute of Viana do Castelo. And he is uh, where, where he is coordinating the, the degree on marketing and communicate in, in entrepreneurial communication. Uh, he was also decent in many uh, institutions of the higher education, uh, of higher education. Uh, you will have 20 minutes sharp. If you please, please uh, go on and uh, present your communication, Professor Lover. Hello again. Thank you so much for being uh, on the behind of, of the screen on this sunny day. And I hope uh, you can get as clear as possible. Um, first of all, first of all, um, um, I would like uh, you to, to ask your in order to, to make some some context. This is the the evolution of people in need uh, during uh, uh, this this period. Now this is uh, I have here some 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 uh, worst humanitarian crisis uh, some data uh, in uh, this this year of course these data are collected only collected this year but uh, um, um, a huge period of of years uh, we have here um, Sudan um, Syria. Somalia, Somalia, Myanmar, uh, 
Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Nigeria, Yemen, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and only these these uh, um, these countries uh, has this number, this uh, enormous number of people. Uh, in it only only in these these countries. Uh, in order to 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 uh, increase um, the the contest and of this community uh, communication and humanitarian crisis, um, information communication technologies are everywhere. Uh, from the minute uh, you, uh, we awake until we fall asleep, as we uh, we are always connected, uh, inclusively. During our sleep, we, we don't turn off the wireless. Uh, communication is everywhere. Information communication technologies are uh, increasingly becoming a, def uh, a defining component of 21st century humanitarian response operations during both natural disasters, health situations, and armed conflicts. Humanitarian communication has at times remained a crucial component of humanitarian response. Uh, humanitarian communication is a technical capacity building, uh, information collecting and dissemination, pre preparedness activities, and or data analysis for purposes of saving, alleviating suffering and protecting the dignity of crisis affected populations when performed in accordance with international standards of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. It has broadly empowered human interaction and mutual understanding with circles and arenas of conflict and disasters. That's why it's not an easy text. Information communication technologies are employed in a variety of ways by non-governmental, governmental and local communities and actors, a trend which is likely to continue with ever more complex implications for organizations and affected communities. Of the more prevalent uses of information communication technologies in humanitarian contexts by humanitarian organizations and affected populations include Remotely collecting and analyzing social media, geospatial data and other sources of data. Communication information in order to improve situa situational awareness and dispel rumors. And finally, connecting effective relations to response activities. Communities tend to suffer more from disaster. Uh, when there is imprecision and non-existent of adequate uh, um, facts. This is because deficit of critical information can lead to information decision-making, which can trigger excessive stress and early suffering. A planned plan crisis communication for this kind of situation helps to lessen the harmful effect of misdirected communication. According to the authors Raymond Cardenacher, Humanitarian communication is a multifaceted component that renders cross-cutting service and backing to all humanitarian actors in the humanitarian arena. It entails appropriate coordination, framing, and design strategic campaigns that are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. These are the smart objectives. For the, for the benefit of all stakeholders, affect, uh, affected communities, humanitarian responders, and governments. Aid organizations are increasingly uh, recognizing and priori prioritizing communication as a form of existence, 
as one important as water, food, uh, and shelter, according to the World Disaster Report. Without access to information, disaster survivors cannot access to help they need or make informative decisions about their recovery. Disasters like Typhoon Ayan uh, show that uh, humanitarian actors are increasingly using communication tools, radio, mobile phones, phones, media, to access, communicate, and disseminate information that may save lives or improve uh, living conditions. On the other hand, but there was a grand fire, it was a problem here in Portugal, where the integrated systems of emergency and safety networks in Portugal designated by did not work, with the results we Portuguese people know, unfortunately. However, there is, there is little or non-acceptable doctrine, uh, nor precedence for applying traditional humanitarian principles to information communication technologies supported operations. This gap in pedagogy uh, is an urge, uh, urgent issue given that both risk and to the humanitarian environment and direct threats to the human security of populations and organizations involved. Um, in this world, are multiplying and transforming and transforming faster than the sector has adapted, adapted to face them. Humanitarian actors are um, increasingly uh, regard, required to access and manage the, neg the negative impact that these technologies may create or, uh, and or magnify with the uh, little agreed guidance about how to do so. The goal of this, the goal of this communication uh, is to frame four critical questions that may help to address the pedagogical in the humanitarian sector in this area. Uh, first, what is humanitarian communication? It's conceptualized the term humanitarian communication. Second, how do we identify the types of humanitarian communication? Three, how do we design effective communication plan? And fourth, uh, is it possible to describe the experience of the importance of information and technology in actors lived in the first person the experience of a humanitarian crisis. Uh, starting from a qualitative proposal and with in-depth interviews, as well uh, as the relevant bi uh, bibliographic collection research, uh, we built our uh, methodological uh, design of this incident, which I am now presenting to you in order to find some, some answers. The model of humanitarian communication has been vastly conceptualized by the International Organization for Migration as the communication strategy of creating meaning and mutual understanding between relevant stakeholders um, involved in humanitarian affairs or activities globally. And we are comfortable with this approach. The key components are taking into account the information needs of the feedback from affected communities in developing an appropriate information response and providing communication service to humanitarian actors by disseminating assistance related information to affected communities. From, from these two components, uh, humanitarian communication stands for technical capacity building information collection and dissemination, prepared less activities and data analysis of purpose of saving uh, lives. Getting uh, suffering and protecting the dignity of crisis affected populations when performed in accordance with international standards of humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence, according to Wilson, Moses and Wilson again. Several authors give us a way to find the different types of humanitarian communication. Uh, operational communication, beneficiary communication or dissemination, and communication for uh, development. The first one, operation, operational communication, is the transformation of information between humanitarian actors and in, interlocutors. In most of cases, these interlocutors are personal personalities from academic circles, civil society organizations, and government officials. Operational communications is divided into two. 
internal operation communications and external operation uh, communications. The second one, beneficiary communication or dissemination, uh, is about um, um, empowering people uh, by giving them a voice to participate in their own. It connects humanitarian programming with vulnerable people employing appropriate communication channels to provide and receive information. The last one, communication for development. It is a tool used in, in humanitarian communication circle and uh, beyond to promote social and political transformation through in, uh, in participation. It also promotes social change using the methods and instruments of interpersonal communication, community media, and modern information technologies. The aim to uh, the aim is to uh, enhance, enhance community engagement, social mobilization, and behavior uh, change. Humanitarian communication is indeed very important. However, it's important so that in further investigation we can fit into which typology we are moving or even for the respective transfer of technology and operation in a situation of humanitarian crisis. After defining the type of, of humanitarian communication, you, we are ready to define the communication plan. How do we design an effective communication plan? It's the third question we intend to respond. Um, determine goal, goals, identify and profile audience, develop message, Select, select communication channels, choose activities and materials, establish partnership, implement plan and evaluate uh, uh, and make mid-course corrections. This is a classic design for every communication plan. So, uh, what are the differences uh, in uh, humanitarian uh, um, communication? The unpredictability the dimension of the problem to be solved and the political and social context. However, the, the strategy of all humanitarian communication operations follows a set of criteria. Target audience and most vulnerable groups, for example, the elderly, the impaired women and children, how information is currently and traditionally disseminated, where existent and information are most needed, uh, main issues of concern for affected communities, relevant messages when responding to communities and recurrent key, key uh, messages, relevant languages to communicate in with affected populations, prevailing environment, politics, economics, and safety, possible issues to communicate, including, including political issues and freedom of speech, identification uh, of other potential stakeholders, their relationship to the crisis and their participation in, in or impact on the information campaign, feedback mechanisms, uh, complaints and referral mechanisms, mon monitoring and evaluation of the campaign. Um, the first question was, is it possible to describe the experience of the importance of information communication technologies in actors who live in the first person the experience of a humanitarian crisis? In the very limited time I, I had available to, to this task, uh, I, I managed to reach three actors in uh, humanitarian scenarios, and I find uh, a Syrian refugee, a Ukrainian re re refugee, and a Portuguese sol soldier in, in Somalia. An in-depth interview was made to each of them that related their experience with the communication factor include. A minute. Uh, okay, I'm, 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 I'm finished. Uh, the Syrian refugee has been in Portugal for eight years. He arrived in Portugal along with uh, um, other Syrians. He had he had a lot of trouble uh, trouble communication. He felt that there was nothing planned from the except of the, the uh, a place to sleep or feed. He had a lot of giving them a voice of uh, to participate in their own. Uh, it connects humanitarian programming with vulnerable 
sorry, oops, index. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, I must give. Okay, the, sorry. There was no regular uh, communication with institutions. Only got document, the documentation after uh, eleven months. There were no Portuguese classes. Even today, he thinks that it uh, was only deposited in Portugal without any follow follow up plan. Um, of these three types of humanitarian communication identified in this in this in this uh, uh, presentation, this one is uh, beneficiary communication, and it seems that to believe the testimony, uh, it completely failed. The Ukrainian refugee who lives in, in Portugal for 15 years and who works in the field of logistics and was responsible for taking a truck with uh, humanitarian aid to the border between Ukraine and Poland, as well as bringing refugees to Portugal, told me he, uh, his experience as operational in this crisis between Russia and Ukraine. Information communication technologies were very important to get the necessary help to take um, to Ukraine as well as to uh, strategically outline the entire trip and also to communicate with the Portugal regional press um, of Autominio region where he lives and uh, as well as to provide relevant information via um, the use of social networks. Even uh, in the open border field, operational communication with militarized forces was fast and effective. This type of humanitarian communication is operational communication and it worked. Um, at the moment, uh, um, it is in a phase of helping Ukrainian refugees where it has had many difficulties uh, when air communication has not been easy or effective with government and non-government organizations. The last interviewee was a Portuguese soldier in Somalia on a mission to training and education of Somali security forces. In this particular case, all, action, all, all actions were very well planned and communicated. The specific operation aimed to help the development of local militarized forces and the formality levels of communication were very high, consider it a success. The fact it is an operation managed by the European Union uh, may have helped to the level of the um, FNCC of the action and uh, communication used for, for uh, this purpose. Um, conclusions. Communication in times of humanitarian crisis is critical to the operational and developed success of communities and people. There are differences uh, um, because there are variables we cannot control when carrying out a humanitarian communication plan. Different actors in the humanitarian crisis have different communication experience and expectations. And uh, if I can give a personal touch to this presentation that I am about to finish, I have gained a special interest in this area and I intend to develop research projects contributing on this way to a cause as noble as unfortunately necessary. Thank you so much for um, your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Over, Professor Over uh, Now, now we are going to open the space uh, to discussion. But before that, allow me to do a little uh, sum up of uh, the, interve the interventions. It, in my opinion, it, it was a good session with very diversified uh, themes in the table, uh, looking for different uh, perspectives of the question um, of uh, humanitarian crisis. We started with Professor I hope uh, to say, to correct spell your name, Nal Bandov, uh, that, uh, that talk, talk, to, talk to us about uh, the Russia Ukrainian clash, the, the, the old question of the trapped beer. So, Russia, Russia um, is um, the state of uh, what they call the annihilation uh, uh, with the rest of the world brings, 
brings Russia from times to times to this kind uh, of situation. And for me, uh, there is uh, there is mm, two questions that that I, I I would like to put forward in the table. Uh, one is probably a naive question, but with all the money Russia has spent and all the life yes spent in this in this war, isn't it possible to channel it to to build a, a healthy society? Um, the, the second question is: uh, Are Fernando. the world condemned to to be or or? at least some parts of the world uh, condemned to be uh, victims of the um, uh, Russian um, drift um, to, uh, towards, towards uh, his imp imperial uh, instincts. Is, is, this will be forever. Uh, then I would like to, to talk about the case and the experience of Lucas in, in Nepal, uh, which brings us uh, uh, um, a question that we, we overlook um, in these uh, questions of, of crisis. At a large, the people hygiene, and in a, in a more uh, focused perspective, the um, hum, uh, human uh, uh, hygiene, namely uh, the menstrual hygiene, which is a, a very, a very interesting topic uh, that we, as I said, we don't address too much, but is the, the sexual side of, uh, of the war and the, the barbarity of barbaric behaviors towards women. Um, we know, we speak uh, often about the condition of women uh, in, in, in the war, but this, this problem, which is a, a woman deep dignity problem, uh, scar is scarcely addressed. And it is a very, very interesting um, standpoint uh, to put forward. Then we have also uh, the, the, the discussion of the status of, of uh, refugees um, that uh, it was brought, uh, it was a team of uh, Isabella research and it was brought by, by Professor João Casqueira which is interesting to see how, how the refugees' questions are, are evolved uh, along the times. For us in Portugal, it's, it's a kind of mythic uh, situation during the World War II. The, the refugees' uh, uh, prototype of... of um, refugees in the uh, I, uh, in in places like lisbon playing in casinos wealthy people just passing by to to a a, a, a new world um, by that time the the massive refugees movement was not in the agenda i think uh, nowadays um, the, the the question take take uh, different different uh, ways and different concepts. And it is interesting, for, in, for instance, how in Denmark, which is considered one of the landmarks in human rights, the question of refugees are ev evolving in, it was uh, br bring to, uh, to us in the, in the, in the, the, the discussion. Um, there is that in nowadays uh, it was not the focus, but I I can put forward that question. In nowadays, with the new nationalisms um, and questions of security, um, I think there is there is a, a kind of elephant in the room, which is uh, to talk about the way the 
the, the countries or the people in countries that accept refugees are, are equating um, their, their views and they, their attitudes towards them and to, to they, how they are frightened by refugees in in for example for example in germany the question becomes very very uh, uh, urgent and last uh, we have professor Robert Carron talking about uh, fernando fernando sorry to interrupt you let me just tell some rules okay uh, because <laughs> you did not stop, so let me stop you a little bit. Just I'm just doing a summary. <laughs> just uh, yes, yes. But let me just tell to the people how it works. Okay, I will turn off the recording, so everybody will feel free uh, to speak. Okay, if uh, someone have any questions and they prefer to work with the chat, they could write the, the questions in Portuguese or in English, then we could ask for our speakers, okay? It's just about that. I will stop the recording now, so you can continue, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wesley. So just, just to, 